Hello and welcome to Kigali, Rwanda and the 2018 African Regional Conference. I'm joined now by Jibril Fahl, who is Director of GK Partners and Professor in Practice at the London School of Economics. Professor, thank you for joining me. Thank you very much, James. Now, you've just delivered a really interesting presentation on the topic of de-risking mm -hmm. on the last day of, of the African Regional Conference, mm -hmm. um, in which you argued that the discussion and concept of de-risking is really a red herring. Mm -hmm. So what has the financial community got wrong about the de-risking topic? Well, let's look at the evidence of de-risking. We're talking of um, countering terrorist finance and money laundering. So let's go by the lived experience. If you look at the incidences proven, not speculative, of money laundering, and if you take of cases of financing terrorism, overwhelmingly it shows that it has nothing to do with small remittances of about $200 or lower sent by hardworking women and men, usually migrants. It has nothing whatsoever to do with that. Yet the heavy burden of the risking is affecting these small financial transactions. So this is why, in essence, it's a red herring. The, what the evidence tells us that money laundering, which is the bigger of the two, usually involves organized crime, um, narco networks, and pro proscribed organizations and countries. And the corresponding banks, huge multinational corresponding banks that are focusing on this, this de risking, all of them have either been convicted in a court of law in the United States or in Europe, or have accepted culpability of cleaning money for known drug dealers. So the evidence of where AML and CFD is should be focused in on those big ones, not the small ones. So this is why having a discussion about small transfers being a major risk, it's a waste of everybody's time. So you're laying the blame at the foot of the regulators and the banks who are targeting essentially the wrong uh, objective here in terms of small transactions and remittance flows and so on. That, that, that's the problem. Yes, and I blame both of them. Because if you take the big banks, it is not true that when the regulators, uh, regulators say jump, the big banks jump. They try to speak with the regulator and influence what the regulator says. And they spend hundreds of millions of dollars every year in lobbying, in influencing, sometimes even in manners that are unlawful to affect what the regulators say or do. So they are not doing enough to deal with this with the regulators. They are accepting it as almost an excuse to get rid of these small transactions which might be heavy in terms of process and small in terms of profit. So it's almost a timely and neat excuse. But the regulators, on the other hand, should not give an excuse to anyone to behave in a perverse manner. And there are several regulators who are enlightened, who are on public record, to indicate that it does not make sense to focus on the small ones. One should focus on intelligence-driven detection work to minimize risk from the big narco-traffickers and other nefarious criminals across the world. Now, SWIFT have just released some new research showing that um, there's been a, a massive decline in correspondent banking relationships with mm -hmm. almost every region across Africa over mm -hmm. the last few years. So it's, it's a, a big problem. Mm -hmm. And as you argued on stage, and as you just mentioned, it's the smaller, um, lower income groups that get it hit basically by this problem. Yes. So how do we go about changing the, I guess, the behavior of the banks and regulators? And uh, is your message getting some traction out there? I tend to use the phrase when I encourage people to move from the coalition of the willing to what I call the hyperactivity of the devoted. So when you speak with some regulators, some big banks, and of course a whole number of um, civil society organizations, you had Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation were talking about the risking, they all make the point that we should grow up and focus on what matters. What is missing in my view, there isn't a critical mass of connection 
of all of this coming together, that is the enlightened regulator, some of the big banks who accept that there's a public good in banking with small African banks and with money transfer businesses. And institutions like the World Bank and IMF are on record to also make this point. But I don't know why it's missing, but someone needs to push them together, bring them at a critical level, perhaps with a discussion with FATF, OPAC, and all of these guys, OPAC and all of these guys, and say, let's do it once and for all. We do have a good context to do it within, and that's the Sustainable Development Goals, which focuses about leaving no one behind. So, so that, in very briefly, how mm. confident are you that we're going to see some meaningful change on this front in the near term? I'm always an optimist in that if you have these right players, they would stand up and get it done. And if you and the European Union, I think, is more likely to play than the United States as things are now. But I'm more than happy for Europe to go ahead right now without the United States. Professor, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.